Hello and welcome to episode 6. Bienvenido al episodio 6 de Aprender Inglés con Reza y Craig. Reza, hello. Hi, how are you? I'm very well. How are you? Did you have a good week? I did, thanks. Good. What about you? I had a very nice week. It's lovely and sunny in Valencia and I went out, did some exercise and I'm feeling good. Um, antes que empezamos, un pequeño anuncio. Eh, estamos trabajando en una sección nueva en mansioninglés.com para colgar todos estos episodios de Aprender Inglés con Reza y Craig en un sitio. Así que vamos a hacer una sección aparte y cuando esté... ¿He dicho bien? ¿Cuando esté? Sí. Cuando esté, cuando esté listo, eh, avisamos en este mismo eh, podcast. Entonces espero que no tenemos que esperar y todos van a estar, todos los episodios van a estar en el mismo lugar, aparte de iTunes. Reza, gramática. Gramática, Craig, gramática. ¿Qué tenemos? <laughs> uh, what have we got, Craig? Can I ask you a question? You can ask me as many questions as you like. Craig, you used to live in London, didn't you? I did. Tell me. What did you used to do at the weekends in London? I used to go out with friends on a Friday night, on a Saturday night. We used to go to pubs. We used to drink a lot of beer. I used to sleep late on Sundays. I used to go shopping from time to time in the center. I used to go to record shops. Do you remember those? Do you remember vinyl record? records? Vinyl? Yeah, I, wow. I, I used to go to record shops. And the occasional bookshop with my friends. And we used to listen to music. We used to buy records. We used to buy clothes. Mm -hmm. um, the usual kind of thing. So these are all things you used to do in London. Correct. But you don't live in London now. Now you live in Valencia. And tell me, what do you usually do in Valencia at the weekends? Well, now I'm older. And I live in a different country. So at weekends, I usually go to the gym in the morning. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll walk along the beach, enjoy the weather, enjoy the sunshine. Maybe I'll go for, for a bike ride. I usually do some work on Sunday. Yeah. You say you're older, Craig. You don't look much older. You, you, <laughs> look, you look as, as good as ever. I remember you telling me that you, you used to uh, watch a lot of Mickey Mouse cartoons. <laughs> do, do you still now watch Mickey Mouse cartoons? Um, well, on a public podcast, I'm not going to admit to watching Mickey Mouse cartoons. But I used to. I used to watch a lot of television. That's something I used to do a lot in the UK. I used to watch a lot of TV. And oh. now I don't so much. You don't often. Okay. Okay, well, you probably noticed that we used the word used to a lot there. Yes. Craig, you were telling me about what you used to do in London when you lived there. But now you don't live in London. So we use used to to talk about things that you did in the past, but not now. Habits, repeated actions in the past, but not now. When I asked Craig about now... That he lives in Valencia, I said, what do you usually do? Usually is an adverb of frequency. Used to is a verb followed by an infinitive. Used to go, used to shop, used to eat, used to talk. To talk about past actions. So in Spanish that will be soler, solía. 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 Or sometimes you don't need any word in Spanish. You could just say I used to I used to live in London. Vivía en Londres. You okay. could say that. Okay. You couldn't say Solía vivía en Londres. In that case, it wouldn't work. Sometimes you just have to say with the verb used to live vivía. So sometimes soler, sometimes just a verb. And it's interesting because some of my Spanish students confuse used to with usually. Yeah. They use used to when they're speaking about the now present, the yeah, it's present. A they big say mistake. oh i used to go every day yeah. with my friends to have a coffee yeah when they really mean i usually go yeah so let's just clarify now that right now then don't confuse used to plus infinitive for past actions and events and habits with the adverb usually they're not the same now uh craig i'm sure there were very big differences between london and valencia um, when you came to Valencia, 
was it difficult to get used to the new things here? Oh, yes. One thing I remember, I used to go out when I first came to Valencia at seven o'clock, half past seven with a friend, have a few beers, because in London, that's what we used to do. We used to start the evening at about half past seven, seven o'clock in the pub. Right. Used to do that in Valencia my first year. And then by the time we were leaving the pub at half past 10, 11 o'clock drunk, the Spanish people were coming in. Mm -hmm. So we were two or three hours behind the local Valencian people who were going out. Mm -hmm. Then we used to go to a club mm -hmm. at 12, which was empty mm -hmm. because everybody was probably eating. Okay. And But then we, <laughs> we'd, we'd be completely drunk by one o'clock and leave the club when everybody was coming in. Okay, so when you first arrived here, that, that really surprised you. It wasn't normal for you. But did you get used to it? That means uh, uh, acostumbrarse. Is it still surprising for you now or no, have you got used to it? I've got used to it. It took me a few months to get used to it. And then I realized that Valencianos go out mm -hmm. later. So now I'm used to going out at the weekends at about 10, half past nine, 10, maybe 11 o'clock sometimes. Mm. You said now you are used to going out. Yes. Uh -huh. So if you notice there, we used first get used to and then to be used to. Now those two things are similar and neither of them is the same as used to. Used to, as we said, was for past things which are finished. Now, to get used to something means that it's new for you and you will need to change, to adapt, to so that you accustomize yourself, become familiar, acostumbrarse. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. You've just got a new mobile phone. That's right, yeah. When did you get it? I got it about a week ago. Is it very different from your old phone? Oh, it's, it's very different. My old phone was not a smartphone. Okay. This is a smartphone. So right now, I am getting used to owning my first smartphone. It's a new experience for me. I'm changing. I'm changing. I'm becoming accustomed, becoming used to the new phone. But the process has not finished yet. I'm still getting used to it. I'm changing. Me estoy acostumbrando. That's get used to. But I hope, Craig, mm. in a year or so, at the latest, <laughs> then I will be used to it. Oh, less. That's I'm the sure. verb to be, less, less hopefully. I'm sure. So to be used to something means now the change is finished and now it is normal for you. So when you first arrived in Spain, uh, when you saw people eating late at night, it shocked you, it surprised you. You were not used to it. Then you stayed here months and months and years and years. And in that time, you were getting used to these things. I tell you something. And now it's normal for you? Yes. Now you are used to these, these things. Now I'm used to eating later at weekends. I'm used to going out later. And the thing that I really wasn't used to, my first year, I remember the bars and the clubs didn't close. Well, the, bar, the pubs. I remember, yeah. And in, in the UK... Do you remember they used to close at 11? 11. 11 yeah. o'clock. By law. By law. To. And I, well, I arrived in Valencia and they didn't close. Mm -hmm. It was fantastic. So very quickly I got used to drinking all night. Yes, it's easy to get used to that, isn't it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> One final thing um, to remind the listeners with the grammar of yeah. used to solia, it's used to plus infinitive. Right. Used to live, used to drink, used to go. And with the other two, acostumbrarse, get used to, and be used to, it's gerund. That's right. So get used to staying up late. Be used to eating large meals in the middle of the day. Get used to using your new mobile phone. All those things. So ing. Or, of course, you can just have a noun if you like. I am getting used to my new phone. Mm -hmm. But if you use a verb, ing form for the verb. Okay, that's clear. Moving on to pronunciation this week, and I thought we could look at the sound J. Does that sound exist in Spanish? J? J? 
Because when, no, it doesn't. I don't think it does. It because does if it. you have a place like a G E R O N A, Girona, it's Gerona. Gerona. Yeah. In in Spanish anyway, it might be different in Catalan, but in Spanish language, it doesn't exist. It's jamón, not jamón. That's right. So J is possibly only used in uh, the pronunciation of British English. Reza, what kind of music do you like? Oh, all sorts. I like pop, jazz. Stop classical. there. Whoa, jazz. Jazz. That's, that's the that's the word. J, jazz. That's one of the uses of j. Also, obviously, in months like June, January, and the verb saltar in English. Do you know that? To jump. To jump, saltar. For example, jumping Jack Flash, <laughs> the Rolling Stones song. And eh, juez. Judge. That's quite difficult for Spanish speakers because we have two j sounds. Judge. Judge. And uh, not only with the letter J, we also have this sound sometimes with the letter G in words like general, for example, giant, gigante, giant, a giant general, Uh, gym, gymnasium, gym. That's G-Y-M. G-Y-M. Not J-I-M. No, but the sound is exactly the same. The J sound in Jim and Jim, exactly the same pronunciation. G-I-M or, uh, sorry, J-I-M or G-Y-M. And remember, compare it with the sound we had last week with uh, J, which is more like the French J, Je suis, in words like vision, television, uh, leisure, pleasure, mm-hmm. etc. It's very similar, but it's not quite exactly the same, is it? No, no. Very the je, just think of the French, je. I remember the, the French sound from school. Je, je, t'aime. je t'aime. Je t'aime. Not you, Craig. Je I'm just giving an example. Je t'adore, Mickey Mouse. <laughs> <laughs> um, and je, which is a harder, mas duro, a harder sound, like jazz, June, July. January, etc. Any phrasal verbs this week, Reza? Sure do. The phrasal verb for this week is come out. Come out. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, after a long meeting, they came out of the room exhausted. So that will be the literal meaning. Yeah, to physically leave. So movement of the body. They came out. They came out of, of the room. office. Yeah. yeah, yeah, come out. So that that's not too surprising. That's logical. You could figure that out. Mm-hmm. But there are other uses of come out, which are perhaps not so obvious. For example, a friend of mine, Arantia, recently she came out in a rash. She came out in ah, a rash. Yeah. To yeah. come out in a rash. That means your skin goes red and is itchy. What's rash in Spanish? I'm not quite sure what that means. We should check that. We'll, we'll check that for next week. Okay. But uh, when your skin's red and irritable, that's a rash. Mm-hmm. Very often it's used when, when you're not quite sure what causes this problem. You say, oh, I've come out in a rash. I don't know why, but I've come out. And that's Arantia's case. She's not sure why, but she's come out in a rash. Her skin has gone red. And uh, my girlfriend, too, when she eats peppers, she's allergic to red peppers and green peppers. Oh, that's right. Do you know what happens when she eats red and green peppers? She comes out in a rash. She comes out in a rash. I know, because I once accidentally put it in a meal I made for her. Yeah. (laughs) That's how I discovered. (laughs) She she comes out in a rash. Now, Craig, have you heard that uh, there's been a lot of strikes recently in Spain? I have. It's been on the news from, yeah. For a couple of years now. Strike. So a strike, just in case the listeners don't know, strike is when workers refuse to work mm-hmm. for a day or two or a week, a period of time. Not forever, just for a una, period of time. Una huelga. Una huelga. A strike. And to strike can be a verb, a fair huelga. So, um, very often when a group of workers has a strike, another group of workers comes out in support of the first group. For example, imagine that um, nurses had a strike and then policemen felt that uh, the nurses had a just cause. 
So they said, oh, we would like to come out in support of mm -hmm. the nurses. That means they will also have a strike to come out in support of someone. Has anyone come out on strike recently? Yes, at, right at the moment as we speak, the uh, rubbish collectors in Madrid are on strike. I didn't know that. Yeah, they're on strike. For more money? Not so much for more money. I think it's not to have their salary reduced, uh -huh. which is the, the proposal. But I don't think anyone else has come out in support of them. They're the only group striking at the moment. I just thought of another use of come out. What's that? Um, the sun comes out. That's right. Yeah. The moon comes out at night and yeah. the sun comes out or comes up yeah. in the morning. Well, come, you can say come out or come up. Yeah. yeah. More for the moon. The moon. What time does the moon come out mm, at night? Perhaps? Depends. Not sure. Hmm. Depends on where you are and the time of year. Yeah. You say the sun comes out every day. Yes, in Valencia. Not sure about um, Ireland or England, though. <laughs> <laughs> It comes out, but you can't see you it. Can't the see stars, it's behind the clouds. The stars there. come out as well. <laughs> yeah. There's another meaning of come out. Uh, I suppose it's quite a modern meaning. To come out has this colloquial meaning of uh, publicly admitting you're gay. I like to come out of the closet, but yeah. not literally. Not literally. So a closet is uh, like a wardrobe. Cupboard. Closet is preferred by Americans. Wardrobe is preferred by uh, wardrobe or cupboard. By British people. Yeah, but so, you wouldn't say come out of the wardrobe. No, it's about, always specifically <laughs> it's always the closet. closet. You're right. Yeah, come out of the closet. Or people just some, sometimes say come out without mm. closet. I've come oh, out. Oh, he's come out. That means he's, he's come he's, out of the closet. He said, okay, I'm gay. I admit he's it. He's openly gay, so he's come yeah. out. Yeah. He's mm -hmm. come out. This obviously is quite a new meaning of come out. Mm -hmm. But a very popular one, a very common very one. Very popular. Yeah. So those are some meanings of come out. That's probably enough to do us for today, do you reckon? I think so. Shall we move on to vocabulary? Let's move on. Oh, as I've written here, vocabulary. <laughs> vocabulary oh, corner. Welcome to vocabulary corner. Sports <laughs> this week. Do you, in your classes, tend to teach words in groups, in families? I try to. As they are in, in uh, course books. What, what do you think are yeah. the advantages of teaching words like all the sport words together, all the money words together, all the holiday words together, all the travel vocabulary? Is there well, an advantage? Yes. I think any context helps you remember words easily. Mm -hmm. If I just give a student a list of 20 completely unconnected words and told them to try and memorize those words and I would test them the next week. I'd be surprised if they could remember four. But if I give them 20 all about football, I'm sure they could remember at least 15, 16, 17. Because you just visualize a football match, for example, in your mind. And you think, okay, yes, they, uh, they kick off the start of the game. They kick the ball. Or maybe they head the ball. They pass it to another person. You're going to remember the verbs a lot more easily, I think. Entonces, estamos de acuerdo que es mejor aprender las, las parablas en, en un familia, en un grupo. Sin duda. Sí, yeah. Which words do you think of when you hear the word football? Where's football played in Ireland? Mm -hmm. Is it played... Pitch. On, it's played on a pitch. pitch. Would you say it's played, it's played on a field? No. Football field? No. Football pitch. Occasionally people say field in very colloquial English, but it's not really the correct word. It's pitch. Mm. And if people are sitting in seats built around the pitch, then that would be a stadium. Yes. And there's the ball. Yeah, okay. And where you try and kick the ball to get a goal is the net. And what's the name of the judge in a football match? The referee. The referee. But in some sports, there's a different name, isn't there? That's right. In tennis, for example, and cricket, it's the umpire. Um, umpire. Yeah. The umpire. And if football is played usually on a pitch, um, which sports are played on a court? On a court. Let's see. Tennis court. Mm -hmm. Basketball court. Uh, yep. Um, volleyball court. Volleyball. Badminton. Badminton court. Squash. Squash court. Yeah. Um, of course, the word court is also where you'll find the judge. 
that you mentioned earlier. That's but true. But that's another type of court. A judge works, works, appears in court. Yeah. yeah. Different meaning of court, where legal proceedings happen, right? That's true. Also, the scoring in football is interesting because, uh, well, in all sports, because 1-0, um, we wouldn't say 1-0, or 1-0, no. we'd say 1-0. 1-0. Whereas in tennis, we'd say 15 love. So love is zero in tennis and nil is zero in football. Yeah. Um, what else do we have? Let's see. Now, what if the two teams both have no points in football? So one team have nil and the other team have nil. How can we say that quickly? Then it's a draw. A draw. So I'd say Valencia drew with Barcelona yesterday. Mm -hmm. Past of draw, drew. The irregular verb. So let's kick off with aha. Uh -huh. You see, kick off, kick off, as you said before, can just mean to start. So we take some vocabulary from sport and use it in everyday conversation. Let's start, for example, let's start this meeting, let's start this podcast, let's kick off. Let's mm -hmm. kick off by speaking about vocabulary. For example, or I've just thought of one. If you think of a completely new experience, people say it's a whole new ball game. That's right. It's a, a new whole ball game. New ball game. Yeah. Or you could say um, right off the bat, which is an American expression I like, um, which means immediately or to begin with. For example, when we started this podcast, we had over one thousand listeners right off the bat immediately at the beginning right off the bat and that's interesting because some sports use a bat some sports use a racket and some sports use a club golf club baseball bat cricket bat squash racket tennis racket so rackets have strings mm -hmm. is that right and yes. bat has no strings you know one my students often get wrong and native speakers often get wrong mm -hmm. What do people use to hit the ball with in table tennis? It's a bat. Bat. But many people say racket. Because it's roundish. Yeah, they think tennis, table, but it's not. Ah, it's a no, bat. no strings, you see. No strings attached. No strings attached. <laughs> and finally, to round off our uh, vocabulary corner, um, another ex uh, American expression that I like is a ballpark figure. Ballpark figure from baseball which means an approximate number give me a ballpark figure on your expected salary or give me a ballpark figure of how many people are listening to this podcast it's an approximate guess of a number a ballpark figure and of course if this podcast is incredibly successful and we get to hollywood it we we will hit it out of the park as in baseball, they hit the ball out of the park or out of the stadium, which is a total success. So we hit this out of the park. We had a lot of success with the project. Reza, your top tip this week. Okay, this week, my tips about spelling. English spelling is not easy. Not at all. Native speakers make many mistakes. Intelligent native speakers make many mistakes. I know I do. My students often me too. catch me. Me too. And we are teachers. It is not an easy language to spell at all. So, here's a tip. Specifically, spelling ing and ed, participle words. And more specifically, final consonants. Should you double it or not? Mm -hmm. For example, stopping. How many P's in stopping, Craig? Two. The same with stopped. Stopping, I-N-G, or stopped, E-D. The same rules apply. Double P. What about in writing? Only one. Only one. Do you know why? I think it's because if the verb or the word finishes in... Consonante, vocal, consonante, you double the final consonante. For example, stop, S T O P, T, consonante, O, vocal, P, consonante, you double the final P, stopping. But right. right finishes with an E, vocal. 
So you don't double the T, it's just one T. That's it, right. Is that it? That's the rule. Even though that E in right is silent E, it doesn't matter. It's written. So the final letter of the infinitive is not a consonant. So do not double the T in the, writing. The it's a very as, common mistake. The same as hope. H-O-P-E. That's right. Hoping. Do not double the P. Because then it will be hopping. Hopping, yes, but H O P hop is saltar en una pierna, and hopping would be double P, but hoping, hoping. esperar is one P. I see. That's right. So let's test you a bit, Craig. One let one uh, final consonant or double. Um, putting. Double T P consonante U vocal T consonante double the final T putting two T's. Um, running. The same, R, consonante, U, vocal, N, consonante, double N, running, or, yeah, running. Double, running, double N. Double N. What about sleeping? Well, you've got S, L, double E, P, so it doesn't mm. follow the rules, so E, E, P, no, just one P in sleeping. That's right, because it doesn't end consonant, vowel, consonant, it ends vowel vowel constant so we don't double that that's different okay okay so so far so good craig we've been talking so far only about monosyllabic verbs monosyllabic with one syllable sleep run talk stop get put stop etc and the vast majority of verbs we use every day are monosyllabic verbs however some verbs of course have more than one syllable and it's a bit more complicated for those verbs Tell me, Craig, the, the verb regret, which is arrepentirse or lamentarse, the, uh, the hacer or no hacer algo. Uh, for example, I regret not chatting up that girl in the cafe. I didn't, and I wish I <laughs> you had. You regret not getting her phone number. Oh, I do, I regret. So, regretting or regretted one T or double T? Double T. Right. Why? Because, is it because of the stress? The stress is on the first syllable? La primera syllable? No, no, it's on it's the not, second. It's not, it's on the last it's syllable. It's on the last, on syllable. The last syllable. Regret. Exactly. Regret has two syllables. Regret. The stress is on gret, the last one. And it ends consonant, vowel, consonant. So, for words with more than one syllable... If the stress is on the last syllable and that syllable ends consonant, vowel, consonant, then also double the consonant. So regretting, regretted, double T. So what happens with words in which the stress is on the first syllable? Ah, if the stress is in the first syllable, then normally we don't double the last consonant. For example, limit, limiting, limited, limited. one T, not doubled because limit the stress is on li the first syllable limit so l i m i one t e d okay and um what about travel traveling because sometimes i've seen traveling or traveled with two with double l and sometimes with only one l where's the rule is there a rule for that well here's when things start to get a bit tricky Yes, traveling with one L and double L, both are correct. In this case, it tends to be what side of the Atlantic you live on, which determines your spelling. British English, American English. That's it. British people prefer to write traveling and traveled with double L. Americans tend to use only one L. Um, we would have to admit, Craig, that the Americans are more logical. Because if you think about the infinitive, travel, travel, there's two syllables. The stress is on the first, the first syllable. syllable. Trav, so we shouldn't, travel. we shouldn't double the final L. However, in British English, for some reason, which I cannot explain, we do tend to double L. Let's just call it an exception. So in this case, the Americans are... Right, they're following the rule. Well, let's not say right and wrong. They're more <laughs> logical. They're following the rule, yeah. But the double L, the British way, it's not wrong. But the Americans are more logical. It's different. There are other words which just seem to be a special case of their own. Words like focusing, 
mm. focused. So I would spell focused. focus with one S. Me too. But if you check in a good dictionary, you will see that one S and double S both are accepted. Focusing, focused, one S, double S. It's not a question of British and American English there. It's just a case of whatever you prefer. Yeah. Reza, thank you for focusing on that spelling, <laughs> uh, spelling rule this week. And thank you to all of you for listening to this podcast. We look forward to seeing you in the next episode. So bye for now. Bye. The music in this podcast is by Pitts. The track is called See You Later. Licensed by Creative Commons under a BYNC license at ccmixter.org. Si quieres mandarnos un comentario sobre este podcast o una pregunta sobre la gramática, la pronunciación o el vocabulario de inglés, mándanos un email a mansionteachers.com. Arroba yahoo.es.